A deadly police shooting, five officers on leave, and unanswered questions. There's a lot missing from this. Farmington police being told to turn off their body cameras after an officer-involved shooting. Is that normal and is that within policy? Tonight, Fox 13 News talks to the chief of police in Farmington. Criticism over how the new state prison is staffed. Two officers often doing the work of four. Lawmakers appropriating money for the new state prison, what that means for officers there. Right now, a break between storms, but more snows on the way. What to expect tomorrow morning? A booming Utah city inside a growing state. New at 9, the Changes coming to Provo that could elevate the city to the global stage. Back in September of last year, a Farmington man fell 40 feet off of this bridge as he got out of the way of traffic. I look at it and it doesn't seem real. Now, more than five months later, he's up walking and even training to run in a marathon. Live from Utah's news leader, Fox 13 News at 9 starts Enter right 71, now. 71, medic 71, respond to the post office 145 East State Street for gunshot health response. Fox 13 News heard the first call of shots fired over scanners around 327 yesterday afternoon. Now, Farmington police have identified the victim in the officer involved shooting as 25 year old Chase Allen. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm Kelly Chapman. Just within the last hour, the victim's family is breaking their silence. They shared these pictures of Chase with Fox 13 News. They tell us Chase was a gracious, loving soul who was known by everyone in his community to be caring, thoughtful and kind and would do anything for someone in need. They say Chase graduated from Utah State University playing soccer for the school. In a statement, in part, they say, quote, Quote, we have learned more from media coverage about what occurred than anywhere else right now. Officers claim it was a routine traffic stop, yet the officer requested multiple other officers to the scene a couple blocks prior to the stop. This resulted in the brutal murder of Chase at the hands of five Farmington police officers. Our family was not properly notified of Chase's death as next of kin, we found out about Chase's death along with the entirety of our community via news reporters and articles written online. If you would like to read the family's full statement, head to our website. We have it at fox13now.com. Well, Farmington police say Allen died inside a blue sedan after an officer pulled him over because the car did not have license plates. Police say Allen refused to get out of the car and during the attempt to get him out, shots were fired. Farmington police still have not confirmed whether Allen had a gun with him when he was shot inside the car. Within minutes after the shooting, anyone listening to police radios would have heard officers being told to turn off their body cameras. And it's caused many people to ask more questions about the way this case is now being handled. Fox 13 News investigative reporter Adam Herbets is live in studio tonight with that part of the story. Adam. Well, Kelly, I just got off the phone with Farmington's police chief at about 8 o'clock, right around the time we got that statement, maybe a little bit before. We spent nearly half an hour talking about how his department's body camera policy is enforced. And the reason we asked is because of what you're about to hear. Scanner traffic from last night after the shooting. The first call about four minutes after the shooting. The second one about 20 minutes after the shooting. Um, if you're off the scene, you can go ahead and kill your body cam. Anybody want to make sure that all the body cams are shut off now? Cam 4, all units on the Farmington incident, make sure your body cam shut off. So most departments like Farmington have body cameras for transparency and accountability. And according to Chief Eric Johnson, it is normal for supervisors to come in after a critical incident, separate the officers from the scene. Usually that means putting them alone in a police car and then take control of their body cameras. The reason for that is so investigators don't have to review hours of video and so they can make that video open to the public more quickly. Let me just say, I have read hundreds and hundreds of body-worn camera policies for agencies all across the United States. I think a 20-minute window is actually a fairly extended period of time to keep a camera activated after um, an incident has, has ended, uh, even a critical incident. And it makes sense to me. 
That's Michael White. He's a professor at Arizona State University. He says the chief's explanation makes sense. And obviously, as journalists, what we do is when we get that body camera video, we see when it was turned off to see if it was appropriate and within policy. The chief also told us tonight those five officers have not given interviews yet. He says that is also normal. They usually do that after two nights of sleep and after reviewing their own body camera video. The chief said he also has not watched the video yet himself either. Reporting live in studio tonight, Adam Herbetz, Fox 13 News, Utah. Adam, thank you. We will bring you more analysis and information about the shooting as we learn more. You can stay up to date by watching Fox 13 News. Also go to our website, fox13now.com. The Blue Moon Bar and Grill has long been a favorite spot in Lava Hot Springs, Idaho. But on Wednesday, the roof collapsed under layers of heavy snow. When the snow and dust had settled, the entire building was destroyed. It's a tragedy just because we all know the owners. We all know the family. We all know each other in this town. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of people that that's like their meeting hall. They're there every day having lunch or but not. 10 people were in the restaurant. Luckily, no one was hurt. The owners say they plan to build the Blue Moon back brick by brick. The legislative session is just over 24 hours away now from ending, and a big decision to be made is who gets how much money. That includes the new prison. Fox 13 News reporter Maitha Lee Gooby breaks down some of those allocations and what it means for prison safety. Say aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. The Executive Appropriations Committee approved additional funds a day before the end of the 2023 session. This includes money for correctional officers at the new state prison. We are short on, on certified staff, our, our corrections officers. The staff we have do an amazing job and they work hard, but we really need to help them out so that they're not forced into doing so much overtime. About four to five million dollars would go to increasing officer salaries. Anything helps, right? So what we're seeing right now in the budget is uh, uh, the, the ability to, to um, sustain our pay plan. So those officers that we made a commitment to that are on the certified pay plan will will be able to move to the next step with what we're seeing. And a 5% increase for all statewide employees. July 1st, our starting pay for a corrections officer is in that $28.5 range. But some, like Chad Benyon with the Utah Corrections Lodge 14 of the Fraternal Order of Police, say that's not enough. The appropriation this year is akin to a Band-Aid on a patient who is bleeding out. We are not retaining uh, people uh, and getting re recruits as fast as we are losing them. And that's the problem right now. This comes after how we previously reported three correctional officers were physically assaulted between January 21st and February 4th. I think with the additional safety concerns this year, the officer assaults, I think uh, officers and agents who are close to their 20 years they have no incentive to stay right now, particularly under these conditions. Brian Nielsen with the Corrections Department says the legislature is also allocating $300,000 for mosquito abatement. And Benyon says the prisons need more money for retention, recruitment and technology to keep officers and the public safe. The expectation going into this session, particularly with it being such a historic surplus year, um, was much higher because many years we hear Hey, it's a tight year. We're not going to be able to do much. Well, if if you've got a historic surplus year and you can't really do anything and don't really do anything beyond the governor's request, when are you going to? The bill moved out of the Executive Appropriations Committee and Friday evening lawmakers will pass the Bill of Bills, which is the state budget to fund these measures. On Capitol Hill, I am Maitri Gubi, Fox 13 News, Utah. We have a lot more coverage of the last hours of the legislative session later in this newscast. Coming up in our next half hour, we will take a closer look at bills involving the future of abortion clinics in Utah, sweeping tax cuts, a new state flag, and much more. Let's go over to meteorologist Allison Krogan now with the weather situation outside. We saw lots of sunshine early on in the day, and then these gray clouds kind of took over, Allison. That's right. So we do have some areas of snow in the forecast for tonight and tomorrow morning here in Salt Lake. Right now it's 33, 32 for Ogden. 
31 for Provo right now with a few areas of snow coming down across far northern Utah, mainly along I-15 near the Idaho border, I-84 and I-15 near Tremont and a few areas of light to moderate snow. Now we could have some slick spots tonight and into tomorrow morning as we're going to see some additional chances for some snow to continue to move in with a weak system that's going to pass by tomorrow. So with this, Tomorrow morning, about 15 to 30 here across the state. Chances for snow early in the day. For the Wasatch Front, we're going to keep you mainly dry through much of the night, but we'll see that chance for some snow to return about 4, 5, 6, 7 a.m. tomorrow. Could see some light snow for the later part of the morning drive, but what about the rest of the weekend? We'll talk more about that coming up. Utah's population continues to explode, and now growth in the city of Provo is taking center stage. The big developments coming soon to the cornerstone of Utah County. Plus, significant changes made to a massive bill involving air quality. We're taking steps forward, that's, that's all we want. This is kind of a first of its kind step for the state to say we are taking this seriously. We'll break down what lawmakers on Utah's Capitol Hill agreed to. And after getting serious Seriously injured during a morning jog five months ago, a Farmington man makes a remarkable recovery. I'm excited. <laughs> I got another, another chance and I'm going to take it full advantage of it. It's a Fox 13 News exclusive you don't want to miss. Walker Kessler received an award that only five other jazz players have ever received. Plus, we'll hear from Kelly Olinick on the road trip. Welcome back, everyone. We see signs of Utah's growth all around us, from the booming population to new business and homes. Fox 13 News reporter Jenna Bree tells us about some new developments in Provo that could put the city on a global stage. 100 acres of farmland on the west side of Provo will soon become the Provo Regional Sports Park. It was part of a church farm and was originally owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. $20 million worth of federal grants and local funds will build 21 flat fields for soccer and football, 45 pickleball courts, playgrounds, and a walking track. Scott Henderson says local needs are driving the development. We have 330 teams, soccer teams, lacrosse, all playing on 11 fields in Provo. We are having to limit registration, turning away hundreds of kids interested in playing and being active because we did not have, to have, we did not have the fields that they could play on. The park will also host international tournaments. Taking up a lot of farm ground here on the west side of where the, where the airport is and just an explosion of development and interest in really coming to Provo and taking advantage of what, you know, the secret sauce here in Provo. Brian Torgerson says the Provo airport is now seeking funding to add more flights, bring in new airlines, and become an international airport. We feel like the airport expansion is a huge part of making that facility, the regional sport part of success and allowing, you know, teams from outside of the state of Utah to, to fly in and be literally steps away from their field. Thousands of visitors per tournament could pour millions of dollars into Utah County's economy. We're kind of down here by ourselves and, you know, a lot of times we're kind of isolated from the rest of the city, but that's changing fast. The city hopes to open the regional sports park in the fall of 2024. In Provo, Jenna Bree, Fox 13 News, Utah. A Farmington husband and father of five children fell 40 feet off a highway overpass just back in September of last year. Now, just over five months later, that man has made a miraculous recovery. He's now even training to run in a marathon later this year. Unbelievable. Fox 13 News reporter Chris Arnold shares his story that you will only see here. Uh, this is Hayden Gurman. Harold's imagination. Enjoying some quality time, reading to two of his kids, Abbott and August. So back, here we go. On the couch Atkins. inside his Farmington home, a return to normalcy for this loving husband and father of five. Well, German's life changed back on September 24th of last year. It was that Saturday morning where he decided to go for a run, his route taking him along this bridge here behind me over I-15 on West Glover's Lane. I remember running down the road. Um, I remember saying hi to a neighbor, um, and then it just it goes blank. And the next thing I know, 
I was in the hospital. German had tried to climb over this barricade to get out of the way of traffic on his run, thinking there was a sidewalk on the other side. However, there wasn't, causing him to fall 40 feet. 10 feet from the train track, so it's, it was like I hit the ground. My pelvis fell apart and broke a lot of vertebrae. Um, I also um, lacerated a ton of um, organs, like my liver, kidneys, spleen. After 33 days in the hospital, How are you? German returned to this crowd outside his home, including students from Vermont High School, where he teaches seminary. I've had a great support system. Um, my family, my friends, they've all, all been there. Like his longtime friend, Michael Dame. I'm just so glad I haven't, I didn't lose my best friend, you know, to this fall. And it's, he's, he's a hundred percent Hayden. Dame and others have witnessed German's swift recovery. Did that going from having to push his way up the stairs to walking with a cane to now running. Some of the hardest, the hardest moments of my whole life. I've literally had to relearn how to do everything. All while serving as an inspiration to others. He's a walking miracle and um, he's got more to do with his life. He's got more to fulfill. German's next goal, running in the Ogden Marathon in May, something he had just started training for the day his accident happened. It's for my family, for my kids, for my students, you know, for all the pain I had to go through. I'm excited. <laughs> I got another chance, and I'm going to take a full advantage of it. In Farmington, Chris Arnold, Fox 13 News, Utah. Such a great story. Such a good ending for yeah. him and his family. Well, if you were running outside today, man, it sure still is cold. <laughs> you know when you run and you're out of breath and you get those deep kind of cold breath, mm -hmm. your lungs hurt? At least we've got clear air. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, at least we've got that's good air quality, so that's nice. We're going to continue with the cold temperatures here over the next couple of days, though. So temps will be below average by 10 to 15 degrees over the course of our seven day forecast and actually through week two as well. Through the middle of March, we're going to keep things cold here across Utah. So if you've been putting off those walks or those runs, try to get outside while you can. Right now here in Salt Lake, we've got temperatures 32, 29 in Draper. 30 for Harriman right now, 32 for Twilla, 33 currently in Farmington, 32 for Ogden, over towards Bear River, 15 right now, 19 in Heber. Vernal currently 15. You'll be single digits tomorrow morning in the Uena Basin. St. George 39. We've got cold temperatures here across the state. 20 for Milford right now. Upper 20s for Delta. We look at our precipitation chances. These are going to start to go up again tomorrow morning. So if you'd like to take the dog for a walk early in the day, Ogden, you're looking at some numerous snow showers from about 7 a.m. to lunchtime. And then by 3 o'clock tomorrow, we're looking at more unlikely chances. So Salt Lake, we're this red line, 3 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., we're at widely scattered snow chances. Scattered snow for the morning drive, particularly the second half of the morning commute. So we could end up with some areas of slick roads. And for Provo, you're the blue line. You'll see your best chance around 11 o'clock tomorrow morning for some snow showers. But we look right now here across northern Utah, I-84 and I-15 right near Tremont, Brigham City. We do have some flurries in the area, Cache Valley. As we look at the bigger picture here across the state, we've got clear sky across southern Utah. If you've seen in the sky tonight the two bright lights close to each other, that's the conjunction of the planets that we've been chatting about the last couple of nights. Jupiter and Venus, they appear to kiss in the sky, but they're very bright. We've got a lot of clear sky across much of the state. If you happen to capture any pictures or videos of the conjunction, we would love to see those in our Facebook group, Utah's Weather Authority. Tomorrow, a bit breezy here across the region, very windy along the Wasatch back and also into Wyoming. Evanston at 3 o'clock tomorrow. Wind will be gusting about 30 miles per hour. That's on top of cold temperatures, so it's going to feel really chilly there. 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, we've got chances for light snow across northern Utah. This is not a major snowmaker but we still could see some slick areas for the morning drive, which could in turn create some additional crashes. So Wasatch Front tomorrow, our best chance for that snow will be first half of the day, winding down after lunchtime, mostly cloudy, scattered snow, 
and below average temperatures by 15 degrees. I also want to point out severe weather in the southeast and Midwest through tonight, tomorrow morning, then turning to some snow through Illinois and Indiana. For us here out west, we're going to keep with some unsettled weather on and off through our weekend. For St. George, though, you've got a really comfortable afternoon forecast for the next week. You're close to 60 degrees through the next several days. This weekend, close to 60 degrees with overnight temps in the 30s for Salt Lake. Our highs are in the 30s tomorrow with some scattered snow. Saturday, we could see some widespread rain or snow in the afternoon. Sunday, some more chances. More on that coming up in the Super 7 Day Outlook. Straight ahead, a major tax bill is moving forward on Utah's Capitol Hill, where you could see tax cuts. Plus, a big announcement from Governor Spencer Cox about feminine hygiene products. Why advocates tell me this will make a big difference in the lives of Utah women. We'll be right back. In national news, today a South Carolina jury found Alex Murdoch guilty of murdering his wife and son in 2021. It is the conclusion of a trial that lasted about a month. Murdoch, a former attorney, now faces life in prison without parole. He's denied responsibility for the murders. He is still awaiting trial on nearly 100 charges related to financial crime. He's accused of fraud totaling more than $9 million. Freshman Congressman George Santos of New York will face an investigation from the House Ethics Committee. The bipartisan committee voted unanimously in favor of the investigation Thursday. Santos has admitted to embellishing parts of his resume, but critics say he lied about a long list of things, including his education, his work history, and where his mother was on 9-11. There are also questions about where he got some of the money for his campaign. The House Ethics Committee will look into whether Santos broke any laws. His office says he will cooperate with the investigation. The state of Utah is one step away from this flag becoming official. What still has to happen and the fate of our current flag. If people are coming here believing that they can uh, pray upon our citizens, they're very mistaken. Emerging details on an ongoing gang investigation in Iron County. Plus, a last minute deal is reached on Capitol Hill. The big changes coming for Utah's air quality. It's the semifinals in the 6A state basketball tournament, plus the Utah women open a Pac-12 tournament play. Some last minute deal making has now revived a bill on air quality and it's making some big changes. The bill sponsor says it will be significant. Fox 13 News political reporter Ben Winslow has the exclusive story. I think that's fair. Seems reasonable. A deal was hammered out between the House and Senate on air quality. Representative Andrew Stoddard's bill originally called for a 50% reduction in emissions along the Wasatch Front by 2030. Then he changed it to target U.S. magnesium, which a recent study blamed for as much as 25% of the pollution in northern Utah. The company denies it and doesn't think this bill will accomplish much. A House committee removed any regulatory oversight of chemicals linked to the company. The Senate put that back in. That led to division between the chambers. And I like the fact that it's reported. Make sure that the public knows what's going on the whole time. They compromised on both studies and oversight. We're taking steps forward. That's, that's all we want. We are so excited. This is kind of a first of its kind step for the state to say we are taking this seriously. This air quality bill is getting swept up into a larger discussion here on Capitol Hill about the Great Salt Lake. A lot of bills on it and water conservation are getting through with hundreds of millions of dollars attached to them. I think it's huge. Uh, obviously, if we can get 25% of our inversions out through this regulation, that'll be huge for air quality. Uh, obviously, this company is very under scrutiny for the Great Salt Lake, so hopefully it can benefit that as well. And I think, you know, it's, we got a lot of people that have worked on this bill. Let's keep doing it to clean our air and save our lake. On the Hill, Ben Winslow, Fox 13 News, Utah. A bill that closes abortion clinics in Utah has passed the legislature. The bill would only allow abortions in cases of rape and incest to be performed at hospitals and medical clinics. It also prohibits any abortion after 18 weeks, even in those cases of rape and incest. 
Senate Democrats say it effectively bans abortion in the state, even as a lawsuit moves forward over the state's near total ban. In a statement to Fox 13 News, Planned Parenthood of Utah says, quote, nothing in this bill makes abortion in Utah safer, more affordable, or more accessible for the thousands of Utahns who need this essential health care each year. It has one goal, put abortion out of reach for as many Utahns as possible, no matter what their faith, family, and trusted medical providers decide is best for their safety and health, end quote. A major tax bill that would impact your lives in many ways is moving forward on Utah's Capitol Hill. The House refused to go along with a provision of the bill dealing with license plate fees. That prompted what's called a conference committee, where a bipartisan group of lawmakers met in a room and hashed out a deal. No, now we're, we're in the deal. Okay. So what's our name? Everything, except, Everything else. Else. except a fee. Except the fee. The fee. And the split effective dates and you know, the cleanup for the company. So the fees are gone and that's it? Yes. Okay. okay, I see no further discussion. I'll place the motion to adopt the four substitute. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair, House Chair rules that passes unanimously. And if it does pass in the final days of the session, the bill would drop the income tax rate from 4.85% to 4.65%, cut out Social Security income taxes up to $75,000, expand earned income tax credit to 20%, and eliminate the state portion of the sales tax on food. A startling rise in assaults on UTA workers has led to action taken now at the state level. House Joint Resolution 26 calls for recognition of operators and asks law enforcement to enforce stricter punishments in cases of assault. UTA data shows assaults on UTA bus operators has increased by nearly 50 percent from 156 assaults on operators in 2017 to 227 in 2022. It's something that we've needed for quite a while. The behavior has just got to stop. Police Chief Dallin Taylor says they've already implemented policy changes this year, like putting assaulters in jail instead of letting them go with a citation. Well, you're looking over my shoulder at Utah's new state flag pending the governor's anticipated signature. Today, the House narrowly passed the bill to adopt this as our state flag. Thousands of ideas, comments, and submissions went into creating it. The bill has been controversial, however, with some lawmakers saying they've been branded patriots or traitors by opponents of the new flag design. The bill will preserve the existing flag as the state historic flag. I hope that you'll give it time to embrace the new flag and uh, as a new opportunity to identify ourselves to the rest of the world. Governor Cox has supported the new flag and is expected to sign it into law. Well, Utah did make history today with tampons and pads. I was at the Capitol when Governor Cox made the big announcement. Listen to this. I'm pleased to announce that we will also be offering free period products in all, all of our state buildings. There it is, starting immediately. Those products, which are likened to toilet paper and hand soap as a necessity, will be available for free in all state-run facilities. This comes on the heels of legislation last year with the passage of a bill placing period products in all K-12 through charter and public schools and universities within the entire state. Now, Utah is the first in the nation to create legislation that supports a female's menstrual cycle needs needs and the first for state buildings to offer products for free. The women behind the policy project who brought the issue into the spotlight tell me they are now urging all private sector employers to follow suit. Lean in, offer this for, to your women and girls and anyone who frequents your bathrooms, you will see this um, respect that I think that women have when they walk into a bathroom and they see that they are feeling seen, they are feeling heard, they are noticed, they know that their company is paying attention to what they need, and so they can just go right back to work. The value of having period products in the bathroom is huge. Your return as an employer is huge because now the women in your office are going to feel seen. They're also going to have the product they need to take care of their biology. 
Emily, who you just heard from there, says they hope within five years every bathroom has period products available for free. She's now urging all women to talk to their employer and request period products be supplied in restrooms. Fox 13 News is committed to doing just that as well, and we're very proud of that here. Coming up, a public charter school with ties to the polygamous Kingston group that the Fox 13 Investigates team has been tracking for more than two years is in the limelight once again. What lies ahead for the future of the Vanguard Academy? And it's been nearly five years since Lauren McCluskey was killed at the University of Utah. Today, her mom was on campus to speak at a first of its kind safety conference. We'll hear from her. And we have more storms on the way as we head into this weekend. We also could have some areas of snow for the morning drive. What to expect for your Friday morning and for your weekend coming up. A man who used to serve as mayor of West Bountiful and as a bishop in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has been sentenced to prison for sexually abusing children. Today, a judge ruled 78-year-old Carl Johnson should serve 10 years to life in the Utah State Prison. The crimes occurred over a nearly 30-year period from 1983 to 2011. The judge said the length of time that passed since then is an aggravating factor. Mr. Johnson was able to move on or attempt to move on um, with his life, portraying himself as a uh, as a pillar of the community while his victims suffered in the shadows. Johnson pleaded guilty in late January to three counts of aggravated sexual abuse of a child and one count of sexual abuse of a child. Several other counts were dismissed. The University of Utah just wrapped up its first ever conference focused on campus safety. Law enforcement and educators discussed trends, new approaches, also best practices, all to keep students safe. A featured speaker was Jill McCluskey. She is the mother of Lauren McCluskey, a student who was shot to death by a former boyfriend back in 2018 after campus police did not thoroughly investigate her concerns. I hope that that story makes a change, not only here at the U, but at other universities across, across the country and across the world. I've talked with so many people about uh, who are so genuine and authentic about want, wanting to make, make it safer, make it better. Jill McCluskey says what makes her hopeful is that roughly 90% of the U of U police force has changed over since Lauren's murder. Now to an update to a story the Fox 13 investigates team has been following for more than two years now. A public school run by the polygamous Kingston group has one final chance to make changes or else it will be shut down. Today, the state charter school board voted again to postpone its decision on Vanguard Academy in West Valley City. Fox 13 News has been investigating the school since December of 2020, discovering the school spent millions of taxpayer dollars on family businesses. In August, the state placed Vanguard on probation, but today they said the school still has not resolved problems identified by the board. The school has, um, has gone through a real learning process. We want to celebrate uh, the fact that they're making those choices. Um, and, and frankly, uh, they're, they're getting better as a school and we should all be thrilled with that. Well, the board did acknowledge there is finally some progress, which is why they granted the six month extension. Some big city crime is turning up in southern Utah. The Iron County Sheriff's Office says they're now investigating two drive by shootings at the same residence. Five adults and one juvenile have been arrested on multiple charges, some gang related. Fox 13 News reporter Darian DeBrule was in Cedar City today and has the latest on the investigation. It all began on February 12th when the Iron County Sheriff's Office says they were informed of sounds consistent with gunshots at a Cedar City home. At 7 o'clock in the morning when they arrived or uh, woke up, they observed several bullet holes in their residence. Deputies responded, processed the scene, and recovered uh, 11 shell casings. On Tuesday, police were dispatched to the same home on a shots fired call. At 7 o'clock in the morning when they arrived or uh, woke up, they observed several bullet holes in their residence. Deputies responded, processed the scene, 
and recovered uh, 11 shell casings. Police say they found two firearms that appeared to match the shell casings from the scene. The suspects were arrested and are charged with illegal discharge of a firearm with gang enhancement, possession of a controlled substance, illegal consumption, and possession of alcohol. Many in Iron County are wondering if the shootings could at all be related to Monday's incident at Canyon View High School. We don't have anything that is definitive at this time. Uh, we're waiting for the ballistics to come back on the farm that was recovered, but it may. Sheriff Carpenter had a stern warning for those who come to Iron County and engage in any type of criminal activity. If people are coming here believing that they can uh, prey upon our citizens and that they can conduct criminal intent without repercussion, they're very mistaken. We will go after them with every resource that we have available to us. Police say this is still an ongoing investigation with over a dozen search warrants still out and that additional charges may still be applied. In Cedar City, I'm Darian DeBrule, Fox 13 News, Utah. Still ahead, the biggest convention for all things family history and genealogy has arrived. What to expect from this year's Roots Tech Conference this weekend. Ed, coming up in sports, the 6A basketball tournament rolls on with teams playing for a spot in the championship games. And after winning the Pac-12 regular the season title, the Utes started a run in the tournament. Could they get by Washington State? The highlights are on the way. Welcome back, everyone. After a hiatus due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the world's largest family history conference has returned to Salt Lake City. Roots Tech 2023 features companies like Ancestry.com, FamilySearch.org, and MyHeritage. Now, the first conference was held back in 2012, and people all around the world came to Utah just to attend. They can register for specific classes about areas in the world where maybe they have ancestors from. So there are German genealogy classes, and then there are classes to learn how to take your DNA and look at your results. That kind of sounds cool and interesting, doesn't it? The conference is open again tomorrow from 8 to 6, and then on Saturday from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can also attend the conference virtually and for free at rootstech.org. Southern Utah is booming right now, but unfortunately, so is the need to help those dealing with food insecurity. An expansion at the Utah Food Bank Southern Distribution Center in St. George will help feed people in need. It will also offer additional warehouse space and much needed room for volunteers to prepare food for delivery. The demand grows as the area grows. If we look at all the counties across the bottom of the state, every single county is growing, which means problems that, that with food insecurity are growing as well. The Southern Distribution Center opened in 2011. It serves Beaver, Iron, Washington, Garfield, Kane, and San Juan counties. Last year alone, the facility distributed 4.7 million pounds of food to Southern Utah residents. That is the equivalent of 3.9 million meals. Well, the storm that just left Utah is going to create quite a few problems for much of the country over the coming days. We have another storm that's going to move into the Pacific Northwest through this weekend. We're going to have some weak disturbances moving out from this area of low pressure, and we're going to see those waves at times here across Utah on and off starting tonight and tomorrow morning into this weekend on and off into next week. Now here in Salt Lake right now, it's 33 degrees. We have full visibility. Love to see that. We can actually tell you throughout the evening hours. Many of you will have nice drives, but I am starting to see a little bit of snow up towards Cache County right now. So roads are already turning a little slick and we're not expecting this to be a major snowmaker, but enough that we could maybe have some slick areas for the roads overnight into tomorrow morning and then throughout the day tomorrow we're going to see this storm quickly moving out of here. So over towards the Uena Basin you're going to have temperatures tomorrow rising into the 20s but single digits tomorrow morning. We'll have temperatures about 30 to 35 for Provo, Salt Lake and Ogden for tomorrow at 3 p.m. Logan mid 20s tomorrow St. George you're into the mid 50s and you're close to 60 for much of your seven day forecast chance of precipitation in Ogden for tomorrow will be widespread widespread also on Saturday so we'll have another quick break Friday night into Saturday morning then Saturday afternoon some snow chances maybe some areas of rain mixing in depending on how much you warm up but by Saturday night that's when it is most likely for you 
and then by Sunday day into Sunday night, some more widely scattered to scattered chances. For Provo, your chance of precipitation tomorrow is scattered by Saturday afternoon and Saturday night widespread. Sunday day, scattered snow. Sunday night, back to widespread. For St. George, you have a dry seven-day forecast. Maybe seeing some isolated activity by Monday night, but it's not very likely. So with tonight into tomorrow morning, now through lunchtime tomorrow, we are mainly looking at a dusting of snow across northern Utah from central Utah, about I-70 further north for the mountains. And then up towards the Idaho border, we could see one to three inches for the Logan Mountains, Logan Canyon, up towards Bear Lake. And then for St. George, you have mid 50s for tomorrow, close to 60 this weekend. Then by next Thursday, you might make it into the mid 60s. For us here in Salt Lake, we have a chilly seven day forecast. 36 tomorrow, scattered snow. We'll see widespread snow, maybe some rain mixing in on Saturday afternoon into Saturday night. More chances for some on and off snow through Monday. 30s though, for much of the next week. The Utah Jazz heading into a big stretch of the season that will determine if they're a playoff team or a lottery team. They're ninth in the West right now, but they will be without Jordan Clarkson and Colin Sexton tomorrow when they start a six game road trip. You know, we got a shot to, to make the playoffs and you know, that's what kind of what we're where our heads on where we're gunning for and you know you got to stay with it these last 19 games and make sure you're you know, bringing your best effort and physically and mentally to, to every game in, in order to try to achieve that. And Jazz center Walker Kessler was named the Western Conference Rookie of the Month. Averaged 10 points, 11 rebounds, and three blocks per game in February. The only rookie to average a double-double for the month. He's the fifth player in Jazz history to win a Rookie of the Month honor. The third-ranked Utah women's basketball team played their first game of the Pac-12 tournament against Washington State. Third quarter, Alyssa Peely scores a tough bucket, but the Pac-12 Player of the Year had just 11 points. Then it's Gianna Niepkins for three. She knocks it down. She led the Utes with 18 points. That put Utah up by four. But Washington State outscored the Utes 27 to 11 in the third quarter. And with a three point lead late in the fourth, Larissa Lager Walker, the dagger three. Washington State won it 66 58. Utah is one and done. 6A boys semifinals from Weber State. Corner Canyon swept Lone Peak by an average of 20 points during the regular season. Jackson Roberts finger rolls two of his 19 points for the Chargers. Tonight's led up by a point after one quarter. Isaiah Isaac Stanley leading Lone Peak with 17 points, but the Chargers outscored them 18 to 5 in the second. Double double 26 and 10 for Brody Kozlowski and Max Toombs adds to it. Quarter takes it 72 56, their ninth straight win to move into Saturday's final. In the girls' 6 8 semifinals, Fremont took on number one seed Lone Peak. The Knights running to start the fourth. Nice pass to Sarah Bartholomew. Finishing touches there. On the fast break, Lone Peak built a big lead and never looked back. Nice still coast to coast by Katie Lawrence. Kaylee Woolston led the Lady Knights with 25 as they advanced to the 6A championship game. Sky Ridge led Davis, played in the other semifinal. Kendra Kitchens leads the way for the darts. Jumper is good. She led all scores with 17. But the Falcons took the lead before the break. Elijah Osler scores for two. That followed up by a big Sky Ridge third quarter. And Celius Mealy with a three ball. The Falcons won it 49-36. So it's Sky Ridge, lone peak of the championship game. We'll be right back. Thanks for watching. Hope you can stick around for Quick Cast next.